Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackel Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and These Friends. So there are people who were, born, who were born in Brooklyn, who lived in New Jersey, who go to University of Miami, who then go to law school, who subsequently have an unbelievable career in real estate, who today is the executive managing director at Cushman and Wakefield, and also, in between, is the co-author on a book on English foxhound. And I'm really happy to have my friend Susie Reingold here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, you know, I always like going back to, to the family. Tell me a little bit uh, how your mother and your father met, especially since we were talking that your mother's family are from the Dube family of Brooklyn. How did your parents yeah. meet? Uh, my parents uh, met in uh, high school at New Utrecht. It was my father's family, actually, is Dube family. My grandmother's maiden name was Dube on my father's side. And... They dated through high school, and then... So, so they were Brooklyn people, like me. Right. So they, they were Brooklyn people, and then you said to me, uh, your, your father, when you were born, was in the, um, in the raincoat business, Correct. right? Correct, raincoat manufacturing. Raincoat right. manufacturing, and your mother and father were living in New Jersey, but they wanted to have their daughter born in Brooklyn. What? What was this about? Uh, my mother was born in Harlem. My father was born in Brooklyn. My sister was born in Brooklyn. My mother did not like New Jersey, and she said she wanted you to have a passport that said New York City on it, and that was where I was born. And you were born in a hospital that really had roots to, to the family and the relatives. Right. Uh, really, your father's family Correct. because of the, the park surgical business over there. That's right. So you were born, and then you went back to New Jersey. For a year. Then we moved to Connecticut. Now, so you <laughs> moved to Connecticut. Your, your dad, uh, the, the raincoat business doesn't really do well. And your father goes and opens uh, a retail, a, uh, a high-priced men's retail in a, Correct. what, the Ridgewood Shopping Center? Ridgeway Shopping Center. It was one of the original shopping centers when shopping centers first started. Wait, was, it a, was it a strip shopping center? It w was a little bit more than a strip, but it was still all outdoors as opposed to a covered mall that we see today. And was your father's store a men's shop or a men's and women's? Men's, men's high-end men's store. 
uh, next to W and J Sloan Furniture, some very high end stores in the in the center. So, so you know, if you, you know, since you and I are contemporaries, I remember you know in New York the high end men's shop was like Field Brothers, you know, uh, on Kings Highway, and you know, th you know, and then for example, probably people, you know, there was Barney's, you know, who was a high end men's shop. Barney's Boys Town. Right. So your father had the the Connecticut version of the of the New York City men's on shop. a very small scale. Yes. On a, right, <laughs> uh, on a small scale. Small shop. Now you said we were talking about your mother. Your mother may have worked there originally, but then what happens? They opened up a uh, a Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's opened in Stamford, and my mother applied for a job, and actually, Michael, she applied for a job as a salesperson because we needed some money. And she went to work the first day, and they said, well, you have a college degree. And she went to college at NYU during the Depression. And they said, well, you can't just be a salesperson. We'll make you an assistant manager. And a year later, she became a manager. And a couple of years later, a coordinator. And really, she could have kept moving up, but she didn't want to travel because we were still fairly young. So that's where she stayed. But it was interesting at how fast she moved up. That's very interesting, sir. Now, you, who are your siblings? Let's talk. I have one sister. Younger? Older, older than I am. And she has a husband and two children and three grandchildren. And Now, let's talk about those formative years in Connecticut. Because you, you were a little rambunctious, right? Yes. The, the, that, was that a nice way to say that? Rambunctious? That was very nice. Okay. So you were a little rambunctious. And also, um, but when you're like 15 or 16, you get a, a job working for a small law firm? What, what was happening? As soon as I got my driver's license at 16, my father got me a job because he figured after school with a car, he couldn't keep track of me, and it was a good way to figure out where I was and keep me out of trouble. So I worked for two attorneys just starting out in practice in Stanford, and I worked from 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock during the week. And what were you doing for them? Legal secretary. And why did you did you enjoy this? I mean, I I learned to enjoy it. I didn't mind. It was fun, and uh, they were very nice to me, and it helped because then in the summers I worked for two law firms, so I could work full time for different firms, and um, I worked through college and I worked through law school. But let's get to be to college. <laughs> you said you were besides being a rambunctious trouble kid. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, you you, um, you you could have possibly got into the Ivies. You said to me. But you decided to uh, go to Miami. Now, right. when you and I met, I was kibitzing and saying, did you go to Miami of Ohio, which was a very good school, or did you go to the University of Miami? You know, over there you would have been able to start with the early bird dinners and, you know, other s scenarios. <laughs> uh, you went to the University of Miami. Correct. Uh, your parents allowed the rambunctious daughter to go to the University well, of Miami? they really... <laughs> They didn't realize what I was doing, I think, at first. I wanted to go to Stanford, and I thought I'd really like to go to California. And my mother said, we really can't afford to send you that far away. And being me, I said, well, how far can I go? And she said, well, I don't know, maybe Florida. And next thing she knew, I had applied early acceptance, and I was accepted two weeks later, and that's where so I went. Uh, so let's talk about those years. You said in the summers you worked. Uh, doing some legal work for other people. You, did you enjoy your time in Florida? Oh, yes. I enjoyed Miami. Um, I went through school in three years instead of four. It was a different experience for me because I really had lived in New England, and even though we were very much tied to New York, I also, being in Connecticut, had not met some of the people from other parts of the so country. So it was more provincial. And it was a little bit different meeting people um, probably um, from better economic backgrounds, um, who went to college for reasons that were different than I went to college. I think they were... Now, did you, when you... Now, first of all, you did in three years as opposed to four. Right. Why did you do it then? Um, I knew, I, by then I knew I wanted to go to law school. And I thought seven years of school, and at that time, women were expected to get married. You know, that was... These girls I met at school were there to find husbands. And I thought right away, I said, you know, if I do four years of college and then three years of law school, I might get sidetracked. So maybe I'll just zip through school and do it all in six years. 
So you you go you, you but your first year you don't go to NYU. Where do you go the first year of law? First year of law school, I went to Boston University. I had friends who were still in college up there, and they liked Boston. Um, I liked the school. I didn't like Boston all that much, and my mother was ill at the time, so I transferred to NYU after my first year. And uh, during the the summers, the second and third year, where do you work um, when you were at law school? Um, I worked for law firms, but I'm in, in Manhattan for law firms. Yeah, I remember where I worked. So now, the, now we have this young Susie Rheingold. Uh, who graduates uh, law school, and what happens? I mean, part of the biggest problem is that females, lawyers, were not a really, you know, it was a no-no. It wasn't a business to speak of. You right. know, it, was a, it was a difficult business to get into. So what do you do? It was a difficult job market. I had to decide what direction to go in. I had a lot of loans and such to pay off. Um, I got a job with the city of New York thinking I would do a lot of social good and it was with uh, the Department of Social Services and at the time the goal was to see if children who were in foster care and situations outside of the home could be freed up for adoption. But this was right after a very famous case, the baby Lenore case, which you may remember. And What was the baby Lenore for my audience? Parents had... Uh, uh, they freed this child for adoption and the parents attempted to get the child back and the foster parent, the new parents, had, adoptive parents, had taken the child to Florida and the city was left looking very poor in the way it had handled the situation and I think the child had to go back if I recall. So how long were you at the city now? Four and a half months. But it was very difficult to get anything done. Everybody was afraid because this case had gone against the city and... Um, it just wasn't my work environment, so and I decided I'd try to go make money instead. So how did you get the second job? Well, I sent out a lot of resumes, yeah, and I didn't a hear great, a word. That, that was a great story. Tell me the story about the resume and the letter and you call up, and the, as one person once would say, the letter was either under the pile or somewhere like that, right? Well, I did. I, I had sent a letter to this uh, Sydney Migdon at Gold Farm and Fleece. Now, for, for my yeah. audience, tell yeah. me about Gold Farm and Fleece. I oh, mean, people so in the real estate industry no. know, but what was this? It's a, a small, what I would call boutique law firm that handles mostly real estate and some trust and estates work, and they represent um, some of the very well-known family real estate interests in the city. They do a lot of work for the Rudin family and some of the other families that are quite well known. And it's a wonderful firm. So, so you send resume out. Send the and resume. And what happens? And I didn't hear from anybody. And I hadn't heard from any of these people. So one day I just got annoyed and I took all the resumes. And I'm, you know, that tenacious, tough kid. Yeah, right? the, yeah. The, the, the tough kid who decides, I want to do this. And I called the first resume person on my list, the first person's name, and I said, um, uh, Mr. Migdon, could you please uh, tell me, I sent you a resume and I didn't even hear from you, yes or no. I mean, at least send me a rejection letter. He said, uh, you hold on a moment. And he came back and he said, can you come in tomorrow to meet Mr. Goldfarb? And I did and I got the job and what had happened was Mr. Goldfarb's, what we then called secretary, decided that a woman probably wouldn't be appropriate to hire, so when she was told to set up an interview, she put it at the bottom of the pile. At least she didn't put it in the garbage pile. Right. Well, I mean, and at least I called. <laughs> so so you, you go over there, and, and you said to me that this was great experience because, first of all, you, you really didn't know anything about real estate. No. But you, you gained experience in a different manner. You were able to... Uh, to learn from some great people, but you also met with people who gave you some input and in how to treat people. Sam Rudin, you said, yes. you know, with not trying to chisel or someone would say for a, for a lower commission. Tell me about those things. I used to have to get the documents, leases and whatever else executed by the clients. And I would meet with people like Charlie Benenson or Sam Rudin. And Char uh, Sam Rudin was wonderful. You'd take a lease to him to sign, and he would ask you questions. How much is the rent? How much is the footage? The terms of the lease. 
But he always said, well, get it done. Don't hold out for another 25 cents a foot. Just get it done because the vacant space doesn't pay rent, and you never make that up. And he said, and then pay your brokers. Pay the brokers right away, even if the market's great, because then when the market is bad, those people will still bring you tenants. And it was an early lesson. I learned a lot of early lessons from him. Now, the interesting thing is because of the nature of these families who, in reality, the, these families would, would do deals together. Yes. You, know, you were saying, uh, you know, the Benensons would do business with the Tishes. Benensons, Roses, and Tishes did a lot of deals together. And so you were able to, to, to see and gain insight on, on the New York City real estate market, yes. right? And people like Larry Tish would talk to me anytime about real estate, about his views. Um, Bob Tish, uh, Charlie Benenson was just the ultimate gentleman when you went to see him, was always gracious and didn't make you wait and always willing to answer questions. Any interesting deals you remember doing it during those years? <laughs> oh, the very, very first deal I did involved those three families, actually. And it was the sale of 1180 Avenue of the Americas, and they were selling it to Prudential. And we don't have all day, so I can't give you all the details, but it was an extremely complicated transaction that ended up with about four different groups of people involved in a closing because it was tax exchange properties and complicated middle, middle people in there. And, um, and I met a lot of interesting people, both on the client side, the attorney side, um, a lot of the... Uh, so what happens now? How come you don't stay with Gold Farb and Fleece? Well, that became a, came down to money, really. Um, as much as I love the firm, uh, the going rate for attorneys started to go up. That's when the, the big push came. And they were not willing, really, to meet that market or come close to meeting it. And I was offered a position, I guess I'd been recruited, uh, at Madison Square Garden to become a house counselor. But you know, but when people hear Madison Square Garden, they think of the garden. But the garden really owned other things. Uh, yes. Roosevelt Raceway. Roosevelt, they had just bought Roosevelt Raceway. In fact, the raceway was still open. Um, George Morton Levy, I actually went to the races one night with him. Um, they owned Arlington Racetrack. They had just bought all of this racetrack property and had a lot to figure out what to do with it, develop it, sell it. Um, it was an interesting time. How long did you remain in the corporate world? I only stayed there nine months because I figured out that I used up everything I knew. We used outside counsel a lot, but I wasn't learning. I, I couldn't grow at that point. From and then that. there was the ne next law firm, right? Right. Which, which at that time was called what? Uh, Bear and McAldrick. So tell me about Bear and McAldrick, which was subsequently became a major firm. Right, Schulte, Roth, and Zabel. It was an offshoot of some wonderful young attorneys. I think there were seven original partners who left their major size law firms and decided to... Were there any female attorneys? No. So they, they, they hire the rebel? Yeah. So what happens? Um, they recruited me. They needed some help on a major transaction, and I went to work. There was one other associate, uh, two partners in real estate. They're at other parts of the firm. And we grew. We grew the real estate department, um, grew the practice, and uh, I became their leasing specialist because of my background at Goldfarb originally. And we refined that and promoted it for me, which was wonderful. They had some great clients, and I did a lot of the leasing work. So again, I got to work with Jerry Spire and um, Bernie Mendick and Larry Silverstein. Right. You were talking that when we got together, you know, you got involved with 520 uh, Madison 520 Avenue. 520 Madison Avenue. I have, I should have shown you, Michael. I have great construction photos of um, the brokers and me at the groundbreaking, and it was fun. And, and then you were involved with, I mean, because Bernie uh, had a lot of buildings. You know, uh, he at that time he was may have been with Larry. That were they still? They brokers? were. They had they just were breaking up. Bro broke broken up, and um, we did some leasing for Bernie. And, uh, but I did an awful lot for Tishman Spire, 11 so, West so 42nd Street, 520 Madison. And 11 West 42nd Street, you know, as I, as I was saying to you when I had Larry and I did his life story, you know, that was with Con Ed, the cogeneration. So it was a very intriguing place. It was not, it was not a standard leasing. It was not run in the mill and everything like that. And then 
the, the kid, you know, I still have to call you from Brooklyn because you were born in That's Brooklyn. That's okay. I have yeah, to go you know, from Brooklyn. You know, it's you know, okay. You know, the kid from Brooklyn becomes a partner. Yes. Which was really a major accomplishment because there were very few female partner, uh, female partners in a law firm. And real estate partners, a female real estate, was like an oxymoron. I mean, right. uh, there's something wrong with the Susie Rheingold to get this. But then you move on. What happens? Um, a year after I became a partner, Bernie Mendick asked me to meet him at the Four Seasons for a drink. Said, okay, it's a client. Met him. And he said, I have a proposition for you. I'd like you to come, work with me, run the leasing portfolio, not practice law. You can use outside counsel and be an owner's rep and help me grow the portfolio and, and handle the whole leasing side of it. And um, this was, a, but this was a different thing. You were, you know, you were the in, you were the attorney. You were negotiating the leases. Now you're really working for the owner. Correct. Now you're the owner's rep. You're dealing with the brokerage community. You're dealing with the lawyers. You're dealing with a lot of other people. You're dealing with a great guy because Bernie, let him rest in peace, was a fantastic guy. Yes. Jimmy Kuhn was with him, another right. fantastic guy. And you're over there, and and Bernie's a major player at this time. And so talk about that. You had a great time? I had a great time. I've had a wonderful fun with everything no. I do. Um, it was an interesting time. Um, Bernie was, was acquiring buildings, leasing, and even though the position was different, I did a lot of the same things. I understood the brokerage side because at Gold Farm Police, I negotiated every brokerage agreement. So I knew the brokers, knew the brokers from negotiating leases, um, knew the other attorneys that we ran into. Um, I had to learn more about the space and the physical buildings and what the market was, the financial components of the transaction. I understood how to negotiate them in a lease document, but I had to understand how to actually negotiate the terms. But um, it was fun, and Bernie was wonderful. He'd go to him with an idea and sit down and talk about a strategy with the tenant, and he was very supportive. He and I had a wonderful time doing that. How many years were you with Bernie? I was there three years. And then you had an opportunity with the related companies, yes. right? Now, you know, this was before the related companies. I mean, the related companies, Steve Ross, uh, who I've had, I've done his life, who I have a highest regard for, and I know you do. Yes. You know, Steve originally came out of Detroit. He was a lawyer himself, mm -hmm. lawyer and a CPA, you know, and he, he one day decided that he wanted to leave Touche Ross, uh, or Cooper's and Library, I'm not sure, and he came to New York basically in, because he was a tax shelter syndicator. Right. And he, his business was originally apartment houses. That was, you know, tax shelters, apartment houses, and syndications. And Steve at that time was acquiring some property, and he needed a bright person, and he brought you in, and your, your initial assignment was to go to Connecticut, right. Westchester in Connecticut. Right. So what does Steve do? What do you do with the related companies Well, over Steve there? had started, as you said, buying buildings and developing buildings. And he is so smart that he knew that he didn't know about how you leased office buildings. That wasn't his expertise. So he was wonderful at relying upon me. Um, he had a partner who I worked with also. And he had developed property in uh, Purchase, Purchase, New York, York, which was from Manhattanville College. Uh, and that was called the Center at Purchase. And by the way, last week after I met with you, I actually went back for a little visit. I was having lunch up there and got to see my old project. Um, it's still a beautiful project. And I worked on all the leasing up there. And then also, um, he had bought 625, 625 Madison, Madison, and that we redeveloped. We moved from Olympic Towers to 625 Madison and then lived in the building while they did the renovation. And the main the tenant on was, the building was the Revlon, right? And then, and then we did a major deal for almost the whole building with Revlon. Right. So that was very much a home. And, and you know, it's interesting. I think Steve said to me when I did his live story that when he was sitting at 625 Madison, he was looking down the road and he said, I want that site. In times, you know, you can see in, in, Time in, Warner. That's you right. Could you see, can see, he could Columbus see Columbus Circle. 
and that's how he wanted that site from then. And it was a great story because it's true. It really Steve is amazing. So it came over there. You spend a couple years with Steve. Six years. Yeah. Okay, and then you go to Shorenstein. I went to work for the Shorenstein company. They asked me to open their New York office. They were going to do third-party management. They had a lot of involvement with MetLife. And this was on a third-party basis, which they had never really done. And so they wanted somebody who understood how to run it on a third-party basis. So then, then you get another job, right? What's the well, I, I, I moved. I, I had a, I had a farm in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Right, which, which is. The farm in Gettysburg, does that have anything to do with the English fox sound? Yes. Okay, so you had a farm in Gettysburg. Now, I, growing up in Brooklyn, I never saw a fox town. How many fox hounds did you have? Well, at that point, I had a pack of fox hounds, which is approximately 60 fox hounds at any given time, and I did a lot of fox hunting. And I wanted to be closer to my farm, and Washington is only an hour and a quarter south of Gettysburg. I think people don't realize how Gettysburg is on the Mason-Dixon line, and it's not very far away from Washington. So I moved to Washington with Cushman and Wakefield and helped them develop some uh, business from the owner's rep side of the business on the agency side, and also helped them develop uh, some of the opportunities in other offices, traveled quite a bit for them. But um, after a couple of years, I think I just missed New York and came back. Uh, three years I was down there. So you come back and then? Um, worked for Ed Minsk office and owner's rep for a couple of years. Uh, another legendary office owner, you know, right. successful, very, very successful. bright. and. Uh, I did all of the leasing at 590 Madison. They wanted somebody to really just focus on 590. Great building. Get it Fantastic up, building over there. And uh, we got it done, and, and, it, and it was fun. I always have a good time. And then you remember the guy who you work with at Cushman Wakefield by the name of Steve Siegel. Yeah, Steve and I have been friends also a very long time. And so you go over at this time, it's, is it Edward S. Gordon, or is it Insignia? It had right just now? become Insig Edward, Insignia Edward S. Gordon. It was just right, merged Fox. in, but they were using both names. Right, it was Edward es Insignia ESG. Right. And you were over there, and there you, you were more on administrative. Uh, yes, I, became, I moved into a more managerial area. I wasn't working on transactions anymore, and instead was managing the brokerage operations in New York. So how do you come back to Cushman or Wakefield? It's like life comes full circle. It always So when do, when do you leave Insignia and join? Uh, um, I was with Insignia about seven and a half years, but Insignia was bought by CB, and over a two-year period from the purchase, our management team slowly migrated to Cushman and Wakefield. And your role today, Cushman and Wakefield, is what? Today my role is managing the New York offices, and I also have responsibilities for Long Island, Westchester, and Stanford. And, and what, is the, what is the role of management, would you say? What is the role of management? Role of management is multi multifaceted. One, it's working with your brokers to help each broker develop his or her capabilities. So it's really a coach and it's, it's a, a mentor. coach and it's a mentor, but it's also a police officer and the arbitrator. The arbitrator, the rule enforcer. I'm not sure which thing they think is, you know, I'm told they uh, I intimidate them sometimes. I don't mean to. I don't think you intimidate. <laughs> I, I, I think that, you know, for the uh, the kid from New Jersey, Brooklyn, uh, you know, Connecticut, who went to, uh, you know, University of Miami, Boston University, NYU, uh, and has had an unbelievable career in real estate and, you know, wrote a little book on English foxhounds. Um, and more important, you know, who's really a pillar in the, the New York real estate scene. I'm thank, happy that I've had you today and I hope you enjoyed Thank you, yourself. Michael. Been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.